I did want to mention, I much appreciate the folks who speak when I'm not here, and we have numbers who do, can do that. Appreciate Brother Jeff speaking last week. And you know, Mark always uh, comments very solemn, you know, he says, adequate job. Well, I was thinking, with Mark, you, you can figure out whether it's a play on words. Remarkably adequate job. Is that all right, Mark? Okay. Anyway, we appreciate all who exercise their talents to teach the truth. Remarkably adequate. I want to continue with what the Bible doctrine of man is. And I want to talk today for just a little while on man in this particular life dwells on the human body. Now that's no revelation to you. You know you dwell in the human body. But the thing I find, for I don't know how early on I recognize the Bible's teaching on such things to make one think more about it. But it's awful easy to think I'm not dwelling in this body. This is me. Now you try to separate your mind, you, from this body and you really can't do it. You can accept the Creator's message that says the real you, as I like to say, the inward man, the spirit dwells in this body. But to understand and to separate the two in actuality while we're here, it's just a very difficult thing to do. So we accept God's word on it because he put us together. And we know he also said in James that the body apart from the spirit is dead. That's God's definition of death. Thus death really means separation. You don't cease to be. You just simply are separated from the mortal fleshly body. And we're taught throughout the body while it was, or throughout the Bible, while it was made, that is the body was created by God from the dust of the ground. And we find out that when the spirit leaves the body, then the body returns to the dust from whence God made it. So if we're planning on any long-term indefinite plans to, to uh, exist in this body, it's really, when you think of eternity, it's just a, it's just a blink of the eye in which we're here. I can't understand this either, but in studying the Bible regarding existing in eternity in a complete different place, state of being from what we are now, knowing that it's eternal, then if you lived a thousand years here, it would still seem as just a very quick thing. As James says, our life is as a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And yet we place so much in this life. We invest so much into it. And so much of what we invest in it has not a thing in the world to do with planning for eternity. We need to remember that, and I don't care how much Bible we know, we would do well to cause ourselves to think more about what we're doing with our lives. Because the New Testament, as well as the whole Bible, makes a very clear distinction between the individual person, the real being, and the place, that is the body where the real being lives or dwells, and it's only a temporary thing. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians in the second epistle in chapter 5 and verse 1, writes, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now the word here, tabernacle, refers to the human body. And the literal reading would be, um, if you transliterate, not transliterated, but just pretty literally over into the English is a tent dwelling. Now, we have gone out camping. I'm sure about everybody has over the years. Maybe it was back when you were a child, but uh, you would go in a tent. Still a lot of people do. And you would camp out in a tent. You never had the idea that that's where we're going to be from now on, uh, even in this country, uh, or wherever you might be, we would not think that way. And the Bible is telling us we should realize that about our fleshly bodies. It's just uh, camping for a while 
It's a temporary place. God never meant for it to be considered permanently. And I'm not so sure the devil doesn't work hard to get us to think the opposite, to get us to make our plans and do our purposing as if we're always going to be here in this body, things done as they are, and yet it's, this is just for a brief time. In this life, we're just traveling on a journey. Uh, someone has said uh, we're going from Egypt to Canaan, and we sing songs along that line sometimes, try to get us to understand the pilgrimage we're in. Uh, we pitch our tent here today, and we may pitch our tent somewhere else tomorrow, and on and on it goes as long as we're here. And then finally, death comes, as I defined it a while ago, according to the scriptures, that the body apart from the spirit is dead. So the tent's folded. It's put away, and we no longer live in it. We've moved out of it. People wonder about death. All would. No one's ever experienced it. We can't explain it to somebody else. The actual uh, leaving of this body, the actual moment of departure, and yet the Bible gives us all we need to know. When you look at the account of the rich man and Lazarus, then Lazarus pictured as a saved man. He was in a miserable state, to put it somewhat adequately. But when he died, he's pictured as being comforted in Abraham's bosom. Speaking to Jews in the Jewish mind, while well, the law of Moses is still in effect, and Jesus used what the Jew understood. And to be in Abraham's bosom was the the best place that a Jew could ever hope to be because it meant you're where God wants you to be when you die. But on the other hand, the rich man being a lost man uh, lifted up his eyes being in torments. That's immediate. As soon as your spirit leaves this body on the basis of how we lived our lives on this earth, either in obedience to God's truth or in disobedience, then we're going to be in either a state of bliss that no man could possibly comprehend in this life or in a state of torment. And the same would be true of the state of torment. But back here, it's still a temporary dwelling place in a temporary house. And think of what all we spend on this tent. <laughs> so we need to have something from time to time, no matter how faithful we are, to keep our perspective to realize what Christianity is all about and what we're up to here in this life. This house that is eternal is pictured by Paul as a house not made with hands. This house then is eternal. It's, it's fitted for eternity. As God fitted this present tent for this place, then the next is fitted for eternity. What all does that mean? I don't know. Uh, but if I can understand God knew how to do what he was doing here for our dwelling, then he certainly will take care of things there. There will be the time in which the resurrected body won't be a reality. We'll exist without a body. But Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 looks beyond the time when the spirit is unclothed. And that's what he calls it, unclothed. It doesn't have a body. God meant the human spirit evidently to have a body. And he looks completely past the period, however long that is. I don't know. How do you measure eternity when you get there, if there is a measurement? So for a while, you're, and again, notice I have to use duration here, uh, you're outside the body. But then in the resurrection, you're in the, as a Christian, a resurrected, glorified body, as I said this morning, likened to the Lord's body. Now, what is all this information to do for me while I'm living on this earth, expected by God to be faithful? Well, first of all, it should give us good courage. People need courage. Have you ever noticed how many people don't have any courage at all? They just melt. People nowadays seem to me are more like butter out there in that sun. First little bump and everybody just falls apart. And about all they manage to do is just squeeze one another. I wrote some of this in the last few days and I don't know what I would do under similar circumstances. I think I do because I have been under a few circumstances that call for a little bit of courage. But have you noticed those 50 they, that were killed? They just run and scream and hollered and held one another and he just picked them off one at a time. Rather than I think in this room when you got over the initial shock and there would be initial shock that somebody would start thinking about if they're going to kill me anyway, then 
then let them have a job at it. I'm not going to be just like some sort of uh, melted butter in the sunshine. But that flows back over into Christian living. If ever there's a need for courage, it's living the Christian life. You have to make choices sometimes that put you in a bad light of some people. You have to be willing to forfeit things that a lot of that people without God's word may think is too important to part with. But you have to. It's part of being faithful. And we need courage. Good courage. Well, when I'm about to die for my faith, if that's the case, then I need to understand, as is described here by Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, one verse is following, that this is not the end. Nobody can destroy me to make me go out of existence. I'll just simply change places. And that makes a great deal of difference. So knowing that while Paul says we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, Notice what he says. We are willing rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Really? That means dying, you know. You'd rather die and be home with the Lord? Well, why wouldn't a person who's lived his life in service to God not develop that attitude? And this is not a reflection upon our own trust, faith, confidence in God and His Word and the great precious promises in the gospel for the faithful that we wouldn't long to be with the Lord. Death is a matter of the body getting to a state of biologically not able to function anymore. And we're told then the spirit leaves. Now, we don't know how that's going to happen. And a lot of people just worry their toenails off, if they still have any. Uh, because to, to, what, What's going to happen? Oh, how am I going to die? What's going to, why do that? What kind of trust in God to get you through things is that? So... We need to be reminded that it's temporary, that we ought to be of good courage, that God will make a way. And we sing songs sometimes with the young people especially. I know that God will make a way for me. Well, do you? The Bible tells us it has to be by faith. Our faith is built on the Word of God. So what can I know from the Bible about the way God put me together that will give me good courage? Well, First of all, everybody else has made it that's been in the church or faithful to God through the ages. God saw them through. A lot of times we build up fears. And have you ever, have you ever seen this happen in some other area? You get, you dreaded it. And finally it came to happen. And you got through. And you said, well, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> we scared ourselves together. And made it out to be something a lot bigger than it turned out to be. I think the devil knows that when it comes to such things as death. There's too much in the Bible that gives us comfort. So we ought, to, we ought to study what the Bible says about the nature of man. About how God put man together. Peter, by inspiration, said concerning himself. And I think as long as I'm in this. And notice, tabernacle. He was keeping his mind where it ought to be. This is temporary. While I'm in this tent, I have an obligation. And what is it in his case? To stir up you by putting you in remembrance. He said, knowing that the putting off. Have you ever come home dressed as we are now? And you say, well, before we do anything else, I'm going to get comfortable. And you shed the suit and the coat and the tie and all that. And uh, I always called it, I get my scrubbing around clothes, comfortable. Well, how many of us try to shape our view of putting off this mortal coil and thinking about we're fixing to go into a place of complete rest that's beyond our ability to grasp the rest of it. There's no more temptation to sin. There's no more fight against sin. There's no more problems the body gives us as it is imperfect in the sense of it's going to last forever. <clears throat> we don't have the problems of this life. And these problems of this life are such a part of it, we never think anything about it. You won't, you won't be buying insurance in heaven. You won't be paying for a house in heaven. And on and on, just think of the things that are peculiar to this world that are a part of us, and it'll just be taken away. It'll be gone. And we may look Paul in the eye and say, well, that wasn't so bad after all. So Peter says, I have a job here while I'm in this tent, and that's to 
put you in remembrance of the things that are going to help you be faithful to God. And he said the Lord Jesus Christ had signified to him that that would be the situation. 2 Peter 1, 13 and 14. Now again, note that Peter himself, the real Peter, is clearly distinguished from the tabernacle, the tent, the body, in which Peter lived. It makes a difference if we'll start viewing ourselves and others in the same way. There's another passage, the last one we'll look at this afternoon. Acts chapter 9, 36 through 39. Acts 9, 36 through 39. Now the young people, and all of us know it, in the Bible we find Doris was very kind. She was full of good works for the poor. She was sick and then died, and the widows all cried, until Peter kneeled down on the floor. Tabitha, arise. Simon Peter then cried. They were happy, so happy, when she opened her eyes. So there was at Joppa a certain Christian named Tabitha Dorcas. This woman, the scripture says, while she's in her tent on this earth, she was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she fell sick and died. And, of course, as was their custom, as they washed her, they washed her and laid her in an upper chamber. Well, Lydda was near to Joppa, and Peter the apostle was at Lydda. The disciples of Joppa then sent two men to Lydda to get the apostle Peter. And they entreated him, delay not to come to us. And Peter got up and he went to them. He was brought into the upper chamber where they had, as the old timers used to say, they had laid her out. And the record says, And all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. Now, don't read through that too fast. While she was with them. Dorcas has ceased to be. She's changed places. She was in her tabernacle, serving God faithfully in this life. And she left behind all the good things that she did as a testimony to her faithfulness. And that ought to tell us something about our faithful service to God once we're gone. <laughs> Now she's somewhere else and with somebody else. We ought to think of it that way. I may have mentioned this one time, but you know, when we die, we become completely ignorant of the affairs under the sun, to use the terms of the writer of Ecclesiastes. We're in another place, another situation, another state of being. Things here don't concern us anymore. However, a little thinking can tell us that we can learn things if we are in eternity where we're not concerned about things anymore by somebody else coming later than we got there and bringing a message with them. Well, how do you know that's true? Read Luke 16 pretty close. When the rich man finds he cannot escape the torments of Tartarus, he then thinks about five brethren still in their tents pitched back on earth and he knows the life they're living. So he wants Lazarus sent back to give testimony to them. They not come to this place of torment. Now Abraham was there and he was talking to him. Abraham had no way of knowing about this man's five brethren back on earth. Except that the man's now told him. Now it doesn't take a whole lot of thinking to realize that I can take news into the Indian world of things here. Brother Otis Gatewood's first wife died for all accounts that I know anything about. She was a very faithful woman. And some years later, a friend that was a friend to both of them and a member of the Lord's Church was in the process of dying. And he simply said, would you take these messages to my wife? And so I said, oh, oh, that's so different. Why? Without realizing, without deliberately doing it, that's what the rich man did. I have five brethren. Send Lazarus back to them to testify to come to this place. He brought information to Abraham. Why do you think we've changed from concerning our intellectual powers because we're over in a place that's outside this tent, we're outside this way of living and outside the material? So maybe if you want to send a message, find somebody that's dying. And tell them, take this to them. You say, well, how do you know? And all the people that's over there, they're ever going to get together. That's still thinking like you think here with time and space and the way things function. How in the world did Abraham know the rich man 
And how did the rich man recognize Abraham who's not in a physical body? Did you notice on the Mount of Transfiguration? Yeah, Peter, James, and John, and our Lord. Now, our Lord is transfigured along with Moses and Elijah. Did you ever notice how Peter refers to them? Just like he had always known them. And calls them by name. Tell me how he recognized them. There is a recognition, obviously, that's far different from the way we normally look at a picture and say, you know, you look less like your daddy. Obviously, there's some recognition. Well, explain it to us. I can't. Except to say, there is the fact that scriptures reveal there is a recognition. There is a fact that somebody took information from here into the Hadean world and supplied it to Abraham. Now, if you believe the Bible's the word of God, you can't deny that. That happened. Now, we rarely think about that, but it shows us how close we are and that we don't change our way of functioning, uh, our, our thinking. We're just outside the human body and outside physical things of a material world. But you're still you, just as much as you are you now. And so, as a center of personality, we will always exist. And we have the choice to exist either in glory with God or in torment with the devil. All on the basis of how we view God and His Word and our determination to believe and follow the teachings of the gospel, trusting in Christ according to His Word to save us from sin, save us when we die because we die faithful. What good is 1 Corinthians 15, 58 where Paul is giving the great writing on the resurrection as he refutes false doctrine in the church of Corinth on the resurrection when he says, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor in this tent on this earth and the way things work here, labor meaning faithful service to God, is not pointless, is not worthless. Well, then where will we receive the reward? It's not going to be in this life. Not ultimately and finally. It's going to be in eternity. Well, how, how is it? What are we going to get? Uh, are we going to live in mansions <laughs> like we think of mansions here? The only reason uh, we think of it that way is because we take what is great and glorious here according to man's material mind and we think of that representing our peace and happiness in heaven. I uh, think sometimes that gets abused. People think, well, I'll just have a mud hut there and somebody else will be living in, in no telling what kind of mansion. Well, that's the wrong concept. That's still thinking in, in the tent way. <laughs> there, I don't know how old God's going to do things. But I don't have to know, brethren. I just know the fact that's necessary to say God will take care of it. And that should wipe away a great deal of anxiety from our mind. In the case of Dorcas, they observed the body of Dorcas, the tent. It's laid there in the upper chain, chamber. But notice they say Dorcas is not with us. Wash the body, put it in the upper chamber. But then when Peter comes, they show him these things that she had done while she was in the tabernacle. And they say, while she was yet with us. Well, they're showing him the body. You mean she's not there? Oh, no. I've stood many times at the head of a casket after having preached a funeral. And I always know looking at that body that that's just a house. And I've found over the years that people who are faithful to God who have thought about things like we're talking about here, who made preparation for eternity in the only way anybody adequately can, and that's believe and obey the gospel and live the Christian life. There's a big difference with them when they stand before a loved one's casket. Oh, they see all they've ever seen, and, and certainly sorrow's there, but it's like Paul said, we who are faithful Christians don't sorrow as those who have no hope. We know what's going to happen. Now, going through it means that we have to deal with it. But God even helps us deal with it. In one way to understand that person that once lived in that temporary dwelling place, that tent, is still alive. And it ought to please us to know that they are in a state of blessed contentment. But it does bother me when I see people who have lived ungodly lives. People who have shown no interest in spiritual matters. Members of the church who have apostatized. 
or been overtaken in a trespass, never repented of it, never showed any desire to change back to what they once believed and obeyed. And they may be sick for a year with terrible cancer and maybe the last month or two they suffered greatly. And then they die and everybody, oh, how much better off they are. No, they are not. They are in torment. Because they didn't live like the Lord told them to here. They did not die faithful. And they're in misery. No words of any human tongue can describe. Because they chose to remain guilty of their sin. We should not be found giving anybody any encouragement. When people die outside of Christ or die unfaithful to their Lord. Where do we get authority from our Lord to try to give peace to people by saying this person who never obeyed the gospel or died unfaithful is in you know rest in peace? Have you ever notice how RIP is used on anything? I don't rest in peace. You think that Hitler's resting in peace? Do you think those 50 people that died outside of Christ, do you think they're resting in peace if they were accountable to God when they died? As far as I know, none of them were Christians. And as far as I know, they were at a place that was dedicated to immorality. Do you think they're saved? If we think such peace and people like that are saved, we're in the wrong institution called the Church of Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And yet I fear greatly that we're in such a politically correct world that even in the church, oh, I don't know, maybe they're all right. That's a lack of faith when you say that because the Bible doesn't teach in any form or fashion, top side, bottom or edge, that they're all right. And it ruins all the preaching I've ever done and makes my labor vain. And so every other gospel preacher and every other Bible teacher to give anybody any hope when he has no hope. And we had best be careful that we not do that. Because that's encouraging living a life of sin. To say, well, you never know, they might make it. They're not going to make it. <laughs> they didn't make it. That's why we plead, beg, and implore for people to believe in Christ. Repent of their sins. Be willing publicly to confess their faith in Christ. And then be baptized for the remission of sins. And then live the Christian life. That's why you got all those letters that show what's wrong. What's worldly and what's not. And how we're to stand and our attitude toward them. You know, one thing we get upset about in this tabernacle. Is political correctness. Well, let me tell you something. Long before that began to be used regarding our political affairs and social affairs and moral affairs in this country. Folks, it was already started to be used in the Lord's church among the brethren. We just didn't call it that or recognize that. Don't call anybody's name. Okay. You must have authority from the Bible not to call names when you preach the gospel. Show me. Well, you can't say that from the pulpit. Anything in the divine volume, anything in this book, the Bible, I can teach from this pulpit. Now, if you say, oh, no, you can't teach that, show me where I can't teach anything in this Bible from the pulpit. Show me God doesn't want certain things in this Bible taught from this pulpit. Now, I'm not saying discretion must be used. The Bible also teaches discretion. But I can teach anything from this pulpit or any other pulpit that God has put in this book because he put it here for people to know and to learn and to believe and let it change their life. Nobody can change their life as God wants it changed unless in this tabernacle they embrace the truth of whatever subject it might be and renounce all things contrary thereto and live according to the truth. I remember back in the 60s there was an effort made, we're going to preach the gospel, we're not going to tell anybody we're in the church of Christ. Why do that? What is the motivation? Is it a scriptural motivation? You know, the, the Bible is clear. Church of God is as much of a scriptural term to refer to the body of Christ and the body of Christ as any other, the family of God. 
So if the family of God is the church of God, is the church of Christ, is the body of Christ, then we ought to teach the same doctrine, are we not? As to how to become a Christian, how to live the Christian life, the organization, work, worship of the church. Yes. So if we had chose church of God and all these years taught what the New Testament teaches regarding the church, what are you going to think the term church of God is going to cause to come into the people's minds? Same thing it does in the church of Christ. I had a guy not long ago fuss like everything because I used the term church of Christ. So the next thing I wrote, I wrote, I, everywhere I referred to the body of the saved, I would use one of the scriptural terms. And then I asked him at the end of it, which one do you choose to use? And if you do, why? They never answered. We have a lot of big dummies who appear to be something until they're proven to be nothing. That's not arrogance. That's just simply Ned and the first reader. <laughs> It, it, where are we? Well, when it comes down to dying, you've got to be faithful to God if you're accountable to God for your actions when you die. Or when the Lord comes back, whenever that will be. And there's no use pulling any strings to be politically correct in our speech. You die outside of Christ, you're lost. If you're a Christian and you cease to live right, whether it's one sin or fifty, and you die that way, unrepentant, you're lost. And it's worse with you if you'd never known the truth. Peter said that too. That's one of the things, while he's in this tabernacle, he saw fit to put the brethren in mindful of, to be mindful of. So in preaching the gospel, you have to say to people what they need to hear to make them truly think about their lives. And it may mean that they're going to get madder than a scorched hornet at you if you tell them what they really need to hear. And we may be entering into that very soon, more than we realize or have ever experienced since this nation has been in existence and the church has been here. Now what are we going to do? Water it all down? Try to speak in such a way as that doesn't upset anybody? Paul said, I didn't do that. He said, I wasn't, do I persuade men or God? If I yet persuaded men, I wouldn't be a servant of God. Doesn't mean that we don't try to choose wise things and things to say according to our audience to try to get them to think if they're serious about studying. But sometimes the best way to get people to think is shake them up. That's all while we're in this tabernacle. And when you look at Dorcas, you see she was with them in the tabernacle. She did things according to the Lord's will. They remembered her for it. But they recognized she wasn't with them anymore and they showed the results for her being with them but she's somewhere else. Don't you want to live such a life that godly people, when you're no longer here, will say, here's what they did when they were here, and it's all what God wanted them to do. Don't you want to be remembered for being faithful to God? Look at how we study about Stephen and the death he suffered. First Christian martyr. And look at what we say about him and how great it is. Well, that talks a whole lot better than each one of us would like to live it, I assure you. But yeah, what, why is it in the Bible? What does it tell us? What does it in teach us about building up faith and love of God and love of the things of God and strength to persevere? So as we get through this part, we'll go more, Lord willing, next time. The individual person is one thing, and the body in which the individual dwells in this life is something else. The body of this life is mortal. But the real being is immortal. Thayer calls the body the instrument of the soul. And thus I have to exercise my will to use this instrument to be obedient to God. And that's what my life's all about. And that's what every member of the church is all about, if they would be faithful. That's all that should concern us, is being faithful to the Lord, that first, foremost, and always. Nothing else should make any difference. And we'll be right with everything else. If we'll seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all these things should be added to us. If you're not a child of God, we implore you, we beg you, to take this opportunity, because you may never have another, to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, Confess your faith in Him and be baptized for the remission of sins. If you haven't done that, you're lost, folks. If you die that way, there's no hope. As a child of God, what's your status before God now in this tabernacle? Are you faithful? 
Are you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? If so, then your labors are not pointless or in vain in the Lord. But if not, then you need to repent of whatever sins there are and come confessing them and pray God for forgiveness. They're not only do you and God take care of it that way, but if they've been committed in such a way to be public and you don't know where it's gone, then do all you can publicly to confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. If you're subject to the good invitation of our Lord, we urge you to obey the gospel while we stand and sing.